So most of us can attest to the difficult and the challenge uh, that we face when we don't have enough vertical soft tissue uh, and especially to achieve an aesthetic result. So today specifically what I'd like to talk about are two techniques uh, that has been very, very helpful over the years for me. And hopefully you can use these uh, simple uh, techniques to help achieve a better result, or at least to gain some a little bit of that extra vertical tissue height. And those two uh, tips involve incision design and membrane selection. And the co-relationship of these two uh, concepts and how I'm able to use that to gain this little extra vertical tissue height. So, and I will do this by illustrating a number of cases from simple to more difficult cases. So when we talk about vertical uh, soft tissue, we're really talking about bone and its underlying soft tissue. And the objective in all of our bone augmentation when we're dealing with the aesthetic zone is to try to achieve a normal buccal crest. And that's usually defined as three millimeters uh, apical to the ideal gingival margin. Now, vertical defects are defects that have a low buccal crest. So defects that are more than three millimeters from that ideal ging uh, gingival height. So when we're augmenting, ideally in the end, we would like to have a normal buccal crest, uh, which is that three millimeters uh, from the gingival margin. However, bone augmentation often uh, can result in unpredictable healing due to resorption and remodeling. So ideally, if we can achieve a high crest, that's uh, going to give us even a little bit more insurance uh, in terms of, uh, of our result. So ideally, when we're grafting, we want to get a high crest in anticipation of a possible resorption as our little insurance. So how do we do this? Well, let's, I'm going to share with you a number of cases and illustrate some tips and highlights of how we uh, do, are doing this with this relationship between our flap design and our membrane selection. So our first case is a young uh, gal, very attractive female with a high lip line, and she has uh, a, a tooth that is failing. It's the left central incisor. You can see the fistula forming here. She's undergoing uh, orthodontic treatment, and she is now uh, ready to have this tooth uh, extracted in the process uh, of her orthodontic treatment. So you can see on the x-ray that there's a large radiolucency uh, from her previous surgery, and you can see the scar tissue uh, from the endodontic surgery. She's had an apical ectomy. And, uh, and long-standing fistula formation. So on a CT scan, you can see the large bone defect. After extraction of such a tooth without any type of surgical intervention or bone augmentation, uh, if we leave it just to heal naturally, we can see that we're gonna end up with a severe uh, vertical de uh, defect uh, due to the collapse of this buccal crest. You, I wanna highlight uh, that when we look at the thickness of this remaining bone, it is extremely thin, it's 0.8 millimeters. And the soft tissue is also thin. And you can appreciate this on the CT scan that the soft tissue uh, in this particular case is about one and a half millimeters. So again, without any type of surgical intervention, we're gonna have a problem. So we're gonna do bone guided bone regeneration. So in guided bone regeneration, the first step is the incision design and choosing the proper incision design is one of the most critical uh, elements of the surgery. And there are a number of options that we have. We have papilla sparing incisions, we have sulcular incisions, and we have the commonly used sulcular with distal releasing incision. Well, and the advantage of making a distal release is that it puts the releasing incision away from the graft and the membrane. And that obviously has some advantages and uh, of prevent uh, tissue from dehiscings or wound from opening. One of the disadvantages of making a distant or wider vertical incision is that it is a little harder, more difficult to contain the graft, especially at the buccal crest. Again, remember, our goal in our objective in augmentation is to correct the buccal crest. And if we have graft that migrates away from this buccal crest, we're going to lose that ability to correct uh, our vertical tissue height. So I propose uh, a, a kind of a hybrid of these incision. And I call this the open book incision. It's an incision, essentially, I make one distal, but it's site specific, not a distant vertical. So a site specific vertical, the vertical incision follows the mucogingival junction and back cuts up to the apical, to the vestibule. And then a subperiosteal pouch is then released on the other side. And this, the advantage of this type of incision is that it allows me to contain my graft. 
So when I place my graph and I close this, the graph has nowhere to go except for, due to the apical boundaries and the boundaries of uh, laterally. There's really nowhere to go. It's like a, a, a pouch. Uh, it's less invasive. And secondarily, I can advance the soft tissue coronally to gain my high press if the graph is contained. So let me illustrate what I mean. So from this graphic, you can see we, we do a subperiosteal releasing uh, and this pouch, we place our graph material and here's the apical boundaries. And when we close this, the graph has nowhere to go except for staying exactly where we have had it, uh, we, where we keep it. So here's our flap uh, design illustrated in this clinical case, our open book incision. You can see that the graph is placed and really the graph has nowhere else to go. It cannot go apically because we put enough graph that it can, is well contained. We also cor over correct this um, to the high crest position as you can see where the original defect is and where the bone is corrected to. Because the flap uh, is containing our graph, the graph has nowhere to migrate. It cannot migrate apically or laterally. The second decision that I make is the membrane. Now, it is often said that uh, GBR is technically sensitive because why? Because a lot of times you can have graph migrate, you can have, um, uh, you know, the chat, you know, trying to coordinate all the uh, procedures with the graph and holding the membrane and tacking it down can be challenging. So this is where the advantage of a membrane selection is extremely critical. I, I am using an O6 plus, and the advantage for me here is that once I place my graph, I just wet my membrane and I lay it passively over uh, my graph material to isolate my graph from my flap. The advantage here is that because of uh, the, the membrane has such ease of handling that it essentially lays down without me having to place tacks or sutures and graph. Now you can secure it if you like, but, but I don't. And over uh, you know, close to 20 years of use, I have rare, never had to tack this membrane down. And that's one, a huge advantage to make my surgery a lot more simplified. So I'll place my uh, membrane over this, and then I don't need to tack this. And the membrane, because due to its uh, cross-linking technology, it makes it more resistant to uh, essentially degradation. And in a study that was published by Klinger in 2010, they, sh they left three membranes purposely, purposely exposed. And what they found was that uh, between the uh, BioGuide, the BioMen, and the O6 Plus, after 10 days, there was only one memory that was still uh, remaining, and that was the O6 Plus. Now, one of the disadvantages with some membranes when it's left exposed is that it can get infected, and it's not biologically compatible to healing of the soft tissue. What I've found over uh, these many years of using is that it is extremely biocompatible for the soft tissue healing. So why is this important? Well, this is important because I'm going to purposely leave a small area of this exposed to encourage tissue to form into this area. So here's how we close this. We purposely leave this, leave this area exposed. And then what do we expect to fill in this area? Well, because it's surrounded by keratinocytes, we are purposely leaving it exposed to gain more keratinocytes. In other words, gain more keratinized tissue. And so what do we see over time? Because we can contain our graft without having it ap uh, uh, migrate apically, and we're leaving it exposed with the membrane uh, over the graph, well, you can appreciate that we are now have a high crest. Over time, what you have seen is that from where it was before to four months later, the tissue has gr granulated and we have now more soft tissue, more keratinized tissue, vertical tissue um, to play with. So at this point, what we do is we uh, essentially, you can see the before and the after CT scan, the bone is at the high crest position uh, overcorrected. Based on our, 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 our tooth here, you can see our prosthetic tooth, we have a, abundance of bone uh, vertically. So we can do implants uh, in this situation with very little flap uh, elevation. So we do this flapless. In, in my practice, when we're able to achieve this clinical scenario where we have a high crest with adequate keratinized tissue, implant is always placed flapless if we have those two conditions. So the implant is placed flapless. There's not a drop of blood uh, after we wipe it clear and the patient has much less pain. And there's no disturbance of this new soft tissue that we have developed. You can now appreciate the, the, the extra insurance and in soft tissue that we have, the vertical tissue height that we have. This is a very easy problem to fix. We don't remove the tissue surgically. We just displace it with our provisional. So you can see the extra soft tissue. We have our prosthodontist 
uh, or restorative dentist. Uh, in this case, our prosthodontist, Dr. Gianmarco O'Brien, uh, uses flowable composite to essentially displace the soft tissue apically. And you can appreciate the gingival margin symmetry at this point. Uh, final restoration fabricated by Naoki Hayashi, our lab technician. And you can appreciate now afterwards, because we're able to achieve a very nice buccal crest, a high crest, we are able to transform the soft tissue. Remember, the soft tissue was only one and a half millimeters thick, but yet with no tissue augmentation, how is it now three and a half millimeters thick? It's a concept I call bone-driven tissue regeneration. We're essentially uh, uh, developing the soft tissue where uh, we're, we're achieving tissue height and tissue uh, width. Now we can use this, uh, you can see the before and the after, and you can appreciate the aesthetic, the beautiful work, the restorative work that's done by our team. Now we can use this technology to our advantage in more, uh, a little more difficult case. So this is another young gal. She's about 20, early 20s. This is very early in 2003. I've had the advantage of using the Osix Plus now for close to 20 years. And so um, I, uh, we've been using this technique now for close to that many years. And so you can appreciate in this particular case, this gal um, has, has severe recession on this tooth that's failing and uh, loss of care, uh, you know, the recession has gone into the mucogingival junction. And so compared to the adjacent teeth, we have a lack of keratinized tissue and we have a, a, a vertical tissue defect. So, and you can see here's the x-ray. Now, most people have, that have recommended a number of ways to regenerate the soft tissue from either orthodontic extrusion, uh, followed by either free gingival graft or connective tissue graft, um, and also a bone graft. And in using this, the, the combination of flap design and membrane selection, I'm going to show you how we are able to do, use this concept to correct this without doing any of, uh, of this except for the augmentation, GBR. So here's our, our, our defect. The problem here is that this is a low crest. Remember we said, if we can correct this bone, the soft tissue will follow. We need to make this a high crest. So our bone augmentation is going to start first with our incision design, the open book incision. So what we can advance the soft tissue forward and strategically place our remaining keratinized tissue to allow for more keratinized tissue formation. So you can see our open book flap, our correction to the high crest position with our allograft and the 30% overcorrection placing our Osix Plus, and you can see at this here how it's just being wetted by the blood and it slowly just lays passively on this. Now I will put a few more membranes over this and cover this and then our flap design allows us to strategically place the keratinized tissue next to the exposed area. And we advance our soft tissue forward to a more coronal position. The exposed healing um, fills in with keratinized tissue. You can appreciate it four months, we have a much thicker band of attached tissue compared to the adjacent site, much more than before. So again, because we have a high crest and we have an abundance of keratinized tissue, we're able to place the implant again in a flapless fashion, making our, simplifying our surgery. Here's our before, you can appreciate at three months, you can see the keratinization occurring over the ossex and the bone graft. And at four months, we place our implant flapless, place our provisional restorations, and our final restoration at one year after maturation of the keratinized tissue. And here's at three years, you can appreciate without having to do any adjunctive uh, soft tissue procedure. And lastly, I would like to share with you, sometimes we may have very challenging cases where we have to augment uh, vertically significantly. This is a single tooth defect um, that has undergone a failed bone graft referred to me. Now, in this particular situation, this is a significant, probably a six, seven millimeters of a vertical defect. Now we can probably gain maybe three millimeters and we're gonna use a combination of uh, crown lengthening gingivectomy and advancing the soft tissue vertically by about three to four millimeters to balance this out. We can, you can also appreciate we have a loss of papilla uh, due to bone loss to the adjacent tooth. A very challenging case in a patient that has a very high smile line. So our goal again is to balance the gingival margin by doing a combination to, to create essentially symmetry. We're going to, uh, do gingivectomy and crown lengthening on the on the left right central and advance the soft tissue, creating a, a more balance. So here's our crown lengthening, our open book incision, our allograft mineralized allograft. We lay softly or, or, or passively our Osix Plus without tacking, and then we advance the soft tissue again coronally to create more balance between the two. As you can see, uh, this is at three months of healing. The papilla is still short on this side. 
At this point now at four months of healing uh, with our prov provisional restoration, we go in and place our implant. We do a little touch up of a gingivectomy to, to create more symmetry. And here's our provisional restoration placed on our implants. You can see before and after. At this point, we do a little bit more modification of the provisional to create a little bit more grooming of the soft tissue to create a little uh, more balance. And this is done by my, our prosthodontist, Dr. Gianmarco O'Brien. And you can see uh, at uh, after about a period of six to eight months of provisional restorations, the soft tissue has matured. Um, we have uh, our final abutment and final restoration uh, fabricated by Naoki Hayashi. And there's our final restoration. And you can see the smile line and our final restoration uh, now at five years. And you can appreciate the, the soft tissue symmetry and the uh, creation of keratinized tissue. So I'd like to conclude by, uh, uh, you know, by, by sh sharing with you the concept of flap design and membrane selection and how that can be used strategically to gain uh, soft tissue and to gain uh, vertical tissue height. So I thank you for listening and I hope that this helps uh, in your surgical um, results. Thank you.